Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to come here. The topic of this panel discussion, brain drain or brain circulation, is a bit misleading and potentially dangerous from the point of view of policy making because at the end of the 90s, um, the highly qualified migration flows changed very much. For many years, this phenomenon had been interpreted as a series of permanent um, unidirectional flows from developing countries to developed countries. At the end of the 90s, due to the globalization process, uh, people realized that there was a major proportion of uh, circulatory motions with temporary migration, people returning, and also mm, there were m many new actors uh, uh, involved in this process. There was also a phenomenon of networking because of ICT development. Therefore, these migrants could be in contact with their homelands. But it's not a problem of brain drain. Maybe it's not a problem of brain drain. These circulatory motions are only part of the whole picture. The problem is to see this, to see this phenomenon as a global movement of highly qualified staff and see what the position of each individual country is in order to attract highly qualified workers. Now I'd like to show you some data. One first indicator is the expatriation rate. It measures the number of um, workers with higher education abroad as compared to the national stock, the native stock. So native stock plus the migrants. Um, what the percentage of migrants is out of the whole. Usually, they range from 7 to 11 percent. This is data from the World Bank, but it's old data. I think that this number has increased as far as Italy is concerned, also on account of the crisis. Anyway, it's a higher figure than in the rest of the OECD countries, but it's less high than in the UK. The problem is not just expatriation. The fact is that there is no compensation mechanism. Italy cannot attract highly qualified foreign workers. Italy ranks 11. It attracts only 1.2% of people. Of course, we can't compare with 42.6% of the United States. But comparison with other European countries, such as the UK and Germany, shows that Italy lags very much behind. The important thing is to compare expatriation with uh, people coming in. It's a brain drain with brain gain. This is OECD data. 2005, more recent data will be disclosed in the coming months. Basically, it's a negative balance. We have more brain drain than brain gain. While in the UK, where there is a higher expatriation rate than in Italy, there are many highly qualified workers coming into the country, so they've got brain gain. And in the US, for each 
brain drain, there are 25 people gained coming from abroad. In Italy, this balance is negative. The migrants coming to Italy are not highly qualified. Only 11.2% have a degree compared to 26.8, which is the OECD average. Countries with stricter policies, uh, stricter migration policies requiring higher levels of qualification have an advantage from this point of view. I will skip this. Well, this was in a focus on um, staff or human resources in science and technology, where the situation is rather similar. The issue is not so much that we have a low number of foreigners in highly qualified jobs. We have a low number of workers who are highly qualified in general. If you look at the number of researchers and R&D staff, so we see that Italy is really at the bottom of the slide. We have 9.2 in France and just above 4 in Italy, not to mention Finland with 15.9. The problem also, there's a problem also in relation to attractiveness. Italy has um, not many foreign students in um, science and technology degree courses. And they, Italy also has a low number of uh, foreign students attending master courses. So it's not just a problem of expatriation. There's a structural problem. Our system is not attractive enough. We're not attractive as far as highly qualified jobs are concerned. We don't attract students from abroad or students in doctoral degree courses. We don't really have highly qualified workers in the Italian working population coming from abroad. That's the problem. That's one of the problems. Another problem is the following. Why is it so dangerous to talk about brain circulation? Some countries thought that following ICT development, by connecting all the different uh, migrants' uh, communities, one could disseminate knowledge through these networks. The problem is that there are case studies on these networks um, showing that they worked in Asian countries where the governments made major investments for the creation of startups and other forms of infrastructure so that the knowledge developed would be fruitful for the country of origin. In the Philippines and other Asian countries, these networks um, are not used to transfer knowledge to the country of origin, but they help the uh, possible migrants to have greater job opportunities, so they actually promote brain drain. One, well, from the point of view of policies, uh, one should not invest in policies for allowing these people to return to their country of origin. There should be rather more structural policies as similar to those implemented in the east of Asia, so that all these policies are fruitful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We hadn't agreed beforehand but I think you completed what we heard before with very precise data, the question of interchange 
and uh, qualifications. This is a big theme of uh, the uh, deep north of Italy, of Emilia, and what happened in the last 15 years. It's the inability of it and this area to attract high-quality immigrants and only attract low-skilled, lowly skilled immigrants. And of course, with all the all the consequences that that in fact entails, and that's something that really should be gone into. Beltrami says that in his experience, it perhaps it's more important that we look at the moon rather than the finger pointing at the moon. The number of highly skilled jobs is important, and that has to do with the recovery of the economy. Perhaps this is something which the government has lost sight of, and they're much too short-termist now, people in the government. And that, I think, is the uh, underlines what Beltrami has shown us. Now, we are going to uh, look now to Bain Drain with Simona Emilio. Now, I hadn't, in fact, agreed with Beltrami what I was going to say, so you might have some slides which are very similar. Now, the problem I'm going to look at is the question of the policies. Now, I'm not going to talk about the problem because I'm sure that you've all got an overview of the situation. What I would like to look at is the causes of the problem, what Italy is doing currently to try and solve this problem and uh, face the problem of brain drain and try and start brain circulation and perhaps come out with some concrete proposals so that we can push this uh, question forward. We saw this morning and with Beltrami now uh, the question that uh, the question is not so more much that of uh, the Italians working abroad. I work abroad, and I don't think I'm the problem. The, the fact and the problem is that, uh, in fact, I went away, but uh, in fact, no, Italians didn't come back in, and uh, other foreigners did not come in to take my place. And, and the fact that we only get low-skilled workers, and that means that, in fact, we have a lower um, amount of low-skilled workers, all told. And, in fact, we have the greatest inflow of uh, poorly skilled workers. What are the causes of this brain drain and the lack of foreigners being attracted to Italy? I've listed some of them here. Family, the lack of uh, investments and funds, uh, lower wages, uh, lack of infrastructure, the scant attention, uh, attention of governments that, on scientific activities, a lack of investments, as I said, a limited number of poles of excellence. The foreigner who comes uh, here to Italy, why should he come? He comes to meet an academic, uh, scientific, and research community that he can learn from. We have poles of excellence, but only very limited ones, limited in numbers, and not enough to attract uh, qualified uh, foreigners. And then we have a limited uh, p policies to attract highly qualified human capital. What is Italy doing? Italian policy makers have realized, of course, that the brain drain is a problem, as is the lack of uh, uh, brain gain. And it has developed to the government a series of uh, policies which pinpoint uh, fiscal incentives, first of all, tax incentives for under 40s of, uh, to get people to come back. Again, uh, people who have uh, been abroad for at least uh, two years, they're encouraged to complete their degree course in Italy, learn and back the possibility of going abroad to come back the north-south tax uh, amnesty and special 
uh, terms to be able to bring capital back and then investment in Italians, as it's called, which is a specially um, soft tax deal for uh, Italians living abroad who have decided to finance new activities in their own country. Now, what is really the problem here? There are three problems, three types of problem. First of all, the brain drain is part of an overall context and framework of uh, the framework of policy framework of the economy as a whole. What we're lacking uh, here is a target. I mean, whom do we want to attract to Italy? Whom do we want to have come to Italy? This is the most important question, uh, and has, this has to be answered before we set up any policies. There's a lack of a framework of how and where to invest to keep this sort of human capital in Italy once it comes back. And then also the third problem, which is linked to the tax incentive, is that we want to attract uh, people, but not with a view to really developing the economy and developing the country, but just for short-term tax benefits. So what's the alternative? What can we do to really mobilize this sort of human capital? Experiences of other countries show that the fiscal incentive is not sufficient. How so? Several surveys have shown that unlike other migrant workers who go for e abroad for economic reasons to have uh, economic advantage and uh, lower building and uh, housing prices, these sorts of graduates go abroad, not necessarily just for the remuneration point of view. There are social, cultural, and uh, functional aspects of where they go that come into place. And if the graduate goes abroad with a family, these institutional and social aspects become more important. Now, this problem of assessing the institutional quality of the, the country that you're going to go to is important, especially if you consider Italy as a country, and especially if you consider uh, southern Italy, which has uh, lower grades of all these elements. So it's not just the fact uh, that Italy doesn't have the policies. It's also that there's a big divide between north and south. Now, what do other countries do that are in the same situation? We're not just the only country that uh, can't attract a brain grain gain. They put in, have put in policies which go belong the fiscal aspect, and they have put in place other activities. They um, enhance the infrastructures for innovation and research. They promote technological investments, they uh, make uh, professionals, technical people and researchers more employable. They also f favor and enhance the business climate from many points of view. So going back to Italy, how can Italy use human uh, uh, resources, be they Italian or foreign uh, human resources, to kickstart the country. I think that to offset the situation today, not only should we retain our human resources, which might not necessarily be the right uh, uh, policy, because in Europe, invest in motivity, mo mobility and movement and circulation. So that, if you like, is not the first issue. The question is to re uh, tr attract once again other human uh, capital. And there we have to have a systemic approach which is bound up and woven into the problem. Uh, th this labor mismatch must uh, be offset by adequate school education and university education policies. And this means that we have to 
co in we have to involve uh, the private sector and create a link between entrepreneurs and a university. And we've heard about the mismatch there uh, between what the university is providing and what companies really want. The other aspect is to develop and invest even more in key sectors um, which drive the country's economy. And here we go back to the industrial policies which have to trigger internationalization and innovation, consolidating on enterprises, but especially trying to penetrate new sectors. Now, these are a few examples of areas where young people can be a natural uh, protagonists and where companies in Italy can be reinforced. We could, in fact, invest in sustainable production, digital networks, urban areas, the energy efficiency in building and housing, uh, set up a cultural, a modern and cultural industry, uh, which is not just tourist industry and so on. So watch the proposal that I'm, is put forward to, first of all, create or to understand what the strategy of the country is, where Italy really wants to go, what it wants to uh, consolidate in terms of uh, sort of uh, competitiveness. And then we have to train in these new competitive sectors that will in turn then become a pole of attraction for people from outside. In the short term, one has to try to offset the phenomena of uh, unemployment. But then we have to, in the medium long term, create a specialist model of production for our country. Thank you very much, Simona Miglio. Uh, this is uh, he made a very key contribution. Of course, from um, Alma Lauria, we look at things from the graduate point of view, and therefore we talk about uh, reforms, adequate policies, and so on, with a view to graduates uh, and their supply finding a demand, but also uh, this sort of thing is, and the availability of graduates is a splendid opportunity for companies, for entrepreneurs. And we have understood one thing, that if our industrial system doesn't evolve and become a system of enterprises that, in fact, can have a much greater percentage of qualified human capital. It will not make any headway. It will not become internationalized, and therefore taking on graduates by Italian companies is something which is instrumental to the economic recovery and Italy becoming part of an industrialized uh, economy, and therefore it's not just a university policy, I, that was what I'm saying, but an economic uh, policy. And in fact, uh, this has been pointed out by Bank of Italy in the last uh, three, four years, uh, and has uh, done so in a highly analytical way. Every graduate taken on, especially by an Italian SME, is a benefit for that person, but it also means an extraordinary benefit for the enterprise itself and also then with regard to multinationals we have seen that many graduates work abroad in multinational companies and this is all important because as we know our country also vis-a-vis -vis France and Germany doesn't have uh, investment of, um, uh, coming from abroad FDI uh, to be able to uh, create uh, companies and also thereby create uh, jobs. And I think that the next speaker, Maurizio Marchesini, is going to talk specifically about this.
Thank you very much for your kind invitation. Of course, it's a great opportunity for me. Before speaking about the investment issue, which was highlighted in the press, let me refer to brain drain or brain circulation. The fear of losing our talents should not be a reason to stop human circulation. The problem is, why don't they come back? Maybe we should avoid a dry up drain. This is the problem to some extent. Within the companies, I think one should change gears and have the ability to be far-sighted and appreciate when it is time to turn, to make a turn. A bit like uh, what our grandparents would do when we asked for a destination, they would say, do you know where the that crossroads, uh, yes, then your destination is uh, for turns before that. Usually the companies are not so far-sighted and we are unprepared for the future. Actually, already uh, Galileo said that one should look into a lens and imagine the future, have a vision. The corporate vision must be such that you can continue for 15, 10, 15 years and know exactly when the turning point comes. I had the privilege to lead a small company which supplied filters for the monopoly of uh, cigarette making, then it was privatized. Uh, so the point was to imagine how the company should look like in the future. We started making strategic decisions uh, based on uh, becoming an excellence center worldwide and stopping using certain words, human resources, uh, staff management uh, or employees. We should call them people because a company is people. You shouldn't call people with all sorts of different names. It's just people. They are an asset to the company. We need to enhance the value of people. There are many examples of the parable of the talents in the gospel says that or explains how to make talents thrive. When mentioning human resources, you have a trend to think of them as exploitable resources. People may get confused. In a company, we don't use the word human resources. We don't talk about staff management. You manage a production plan, but you don't manage people. So to have, to allow a company to grow, you need innovative ideas. The company must become a center of excellence. One should also rely on the specific characteristics of a company. We are in a privileged area, which is a high-tech district, a very important one, where there is an excellent network, educational network, very good technical schools and colleges and universities. We can use this as a leverage, but to allow talented people to stay inside the company and retain them, their perception must be such that they believe they can express their talent in a broad sense. 
we need to help them express their talents. You know, when one comes to a company, it's not, he may not have um, so clear in mind that he really wants to take that profession, that job. We have changes of uh, function also because there are people who start uh, on a certain job, then they change uh, to allow our talented people to stay in Italy or come back to Italy. They have to be clear about their career pathway. This is easier in larger companies, but smaller companies should also think of um, how to stay in business in the coming years. You know, if you do the same thing all the time, if because of the crisis someone resorts to another supplier who's cheaper than I am, then I don't know what to do, what else I can do. I think requalification of the staff, uh, of the people should take place within the company in order to be able to anticipate change. Starting from this, it is clear that we tried to invest a lot in young people, creating the conditions for young people to be motivated and interested in uh, working for a company like ours. We've become an excellence center which is highly recognized worldwide. Up to two years ago, our company was the uh, support for highly innovative uh, filters, uh, highly technological filters. Uh, we provide them to Philip Morris. We have become a reference point for the Philip Morris group. We have invested in new technology. We have developed products reducing the risks caused by smoking. Well, this new product will not generate uh, smoke. It's not an, an electronic cigarette, it's tobacco which is not burned. There's no burning anymore, therefore no damage caused by smoke. With innovative technology, high-tech processes, within these processes using certain procedures uh, like good manufacturing practices, we need to check all processes taking place. It's the same practices which are adopted by the pharmaceutical industry. Had there not been a company like ours, uh, we could not have attracted this investment. Uh, we're talking about 500 million euro. The same figure that former Prime Minister Letta back from the Emirates said that we would need. We have the possibility of hiring up to 600 people. Of course, the product has to be successful on the marketplace, but we feel confident about this. I would say that the ability to innovate and uh, give value to people is such that we allow our people to go abroad, but 
after some time, they're happy to come back because within a company, they can have two needs met. You know, I have a twofold motivation to do my job. I have the possibility to express myself all the time and I continue learning. That's why I like my job. I think young people must have an opportunity to continue learning and express themselves freely, express their ideas and be able to use their talents uh, as much as possible and in the best possible way. So career making becomes a consequence of all this. Of course, you have to make things visible. You have to make success visible. In the past, you know, being the boss was a sign of uh, having gone up in the career ladder. I remember this very well. I used to be an engineer, a technician, and uh, whenever I had uh, good achievements, uh, my mother said, uh, well, nice, but when I got home one day and said I became the boss, then uh, she said, wow, but it's not correct. Uh, we have technical careers and managerial careers. Not all people can be bosses or leaders, but everyone can contribute based on what they have specialized in and what they like to do. Continuing to grow all the time. You know, in our companies, um, And also within other companies, um, uh, we often discuss this. Uh, we have centers of excellence, uh, and in Bologna we have several of these. We have to draw inspiration from them. You know, these centers of excellence are closely related to the university to understand uh, what is actually missing. Professor Camelli was saying this morning that we have to teach those um, subjects which are not applied yet. And people should learn these subjects, but the university must be motivated to do this. There has to be a vision a far-sighted vision. Now, we will build something interesting. We're very happy. We're very happy for our group and for our company. By the way, Philip Morris has invested a lot in Italy. There are approximately 200,000 people working in the tobacco industry in Italy. Italy is the first country in Europe in the production of tobacco. We have bought a value worth 800 million raw tobacco since 2000. I think that our city, our region, and Italy as a whole should be happy with these achievements. We were able to build a new plant. We have bought new property in a strategic area and we were able to get building or construction permits within a reasonable time. 
I can tell you that the red tape difficulties uh, were huge. You have to insist, you shouldn't feel depressed, and you should try and find solutions. This is something that people should teach at university. Let me tell you something. I used to uh, learn um, to go to English courses in London. I couldn't speak a word of English. When I went out of the underground, there was uh, Mind the Gap. I was obsessed by this. I didn't understand what it meant. Then I realized that in our working life, we're surrounded by gaps. And there are two gaps which young people have to learn how to bridge. One is solving problems, and another one is being able to generate, set a new B point, because the present situation doesn't make you feel confident. You have to look ahead. You have to take risks, be brave, and generate self-esteem in young people. They have to be ready to take their own risk. Another very important thing is that they continue learning. Their future depends on them, not on those above them. I don't like the word engagement very much. When we have our workshops with our people, we talk about personal leadership, which relies on a few points. I hope I don't forget any of them. First of all, being aware that you count, that it's the company that depends on people and not vice versa. And again, I like the word people and not employees. Then self-learning, you know, you have to continue learning after a diploma or after graduation because, you know, there's always a gap between what you learn at school and the technological innovation. Then the ability of making your voice heard, uh, speaking all the time, asking questions. Then entrepreneurship is another important thing. And one thing I learned in my very first leadership courses is the ability to influence the top levels. Um, you know, decisions are not made at our level, but always a step higher up. So we as individuals, but also as a company, must have the ability to influence the decisions which are made elsewhere. Last point, take risks and be proactive instead of um, being spectators. Thank you. Okay, this is the last presentation. And the various dangers that we are living today, depression is one of the greatest dangers and seeing our manufacturing system as being lost forever. That's not true. In fact, Confindustria, the Manufacturers Association, has underlined how it, many Italian companies, in fact, were recovering considerably before the big crisis arrived. How? Through the know-how that they had within the companies themselves, and therefore their ability to generate new products or services and put them on the market. And in fact, for example, some did gratings, iron gratings, and then transformed themselves and became great IT experts from in this particular field because of their 
the prior know-how. Of course, this was made possible because of the talents of the people that the company had in-house to start off. Very often we say that SMEs in Italy can't innovate or buy from outside what they really need in terms of skills. Uh, very um, often they don't uh, buy or they don't uh, use what they have uh, is because, in fact, they don't have the knowledge of what they need or what they uh, should, in fact, uh, be pointing towards. So certainly the qualification of and the enhancement of uh, these companies is all important if we are to kickstart the economy and uh, launch a, the recovery in Italy. So what has to be done. I mean, the role of the universities. Certainly, we are not uh, the best university in the r in the world, and certainly, uh, the graduates perhaps are the be all and end all of everything. But we do produce uh, good uh, graduates. How can we achieve this marriage, as it were, between SMEs and the graduates, both of which want to grow? Good evening, everybody. I'll be very brief because if I answer very fully the rather polemic question that has been put to me, we'll be here all night. But let me briefly start from the crisis, not to bore you and tell you all about for the nth time why there's a crisis, what the causes of the crisis are, and also I'm not an economist, so I am not in fact equipped to be able to talk about this. But I would like to look at how we can get out of the crisis and what factors can be used. I'd like to start from some aspects of the regional economy here in Emilia Romagna, this region, which is on the one hand very strongly a manufacturing economy. We have the highest pro capita manufacturing index in Italy. And also the other factor is that Emilia Romagna exports. We have increased our um, exports by 65% from 2000 to 2012. We export, especially in the new markets, I'm not using emerging markets because I think that's an obsolete word. Let's call them new markets. And we export more than 30% of what we produce in these markets. Now, why is this important? Looking at the differences between companies that export and those that uh, stick to the national perimeter, well, that's very important because it will, in fact, determine who and what sort of company will, in fact, uh, remain after the, we get over the crisis, also because we have now globalization and companies can go abroad. And therefore, in the light of this very brief analysis, what are the things that can help us get out of our crisis? From my point of view, from our point of view, from the manufacturer's point of view, we have to boost manufacturing, R&D, innovation, internationalization. I'll go back to the question of internationalization because that's much more linked to the whole question of what we're talking about today. When we talk about manufacturing in Italy, I wonder whether we're sure that manufacturing is an approved activity, as it were, and liked activity. And the immediate response would seem to be, yes, of course it is. This is a key thing on which we have to base our activities on. But I think that that's not really so, because we have seen anomalous, let's call them anonymous uh, attitudes, uh, also with regard to the recent question of uh, the steel um, company, for example, when we also decide on what sort of schools our children to go to. If a uh, person and a kid is uh, very bright, by the way, uh, bright, well, we'll send him to the humanities uh, lyceum. And if he, 
he's average, he goes to the scientific school, and if he's not bright at all, well, we send him to a trade school. And that is not uh, the thought pattern or the mindset of a country that really understands the importance of the manufacturing sector for its economy. Um, I, in my group, have a small company in the UK, and when I have my uh, meeting uh, of the group, my CEO says that uh, he will pay a corporate tax rate of 21 percent. And he says, well, next year it's going to be 20, and then it'll go down to 18. That's the sort of company tax rate that I'll play in the UK. And I say, how come? The UK for years has uh, pushed on other things, especially on uh, the financial sector. Now it's decided to go back and recoup manufacturing, and it's doing it in a very linear, simple uh, manner to attract manufacturing and help manufacturers by lowering the corporate tax rate. Obviously, we don't have the same economic clout. We can't do things in exactly the same way. But we can, in different ways, enhance manufacturing and uh, give an impetus to manufacturing in other ways. And this is all important. I mean, this, it has been said very often that the big problem is to create jobs. And if we want to reverse this uh, trend of brain drain trend, if we want to have a normal brain circulation system, we must have the possibility of creating jobs, of employing our young people and making uh, Italy more attractive, allowing them to get a job. When I come home and when I come to Italy, I mean, it might not necessarily be that my home is in Italy physically. I think we have to get across a different concept for what we're talking about before in the past. Before, we used to talk about exports. Now we're talking about something more complex. We are talking about the possibility of having subsidiaries or companies abroad and being able to integrate more completely with cultures which are completely different to our own and with which we have to interact in a different way. So that's what means brain circulation and Indeed, brain circulation is a key to a situation like this. Uh, my Chinese subsidiary had a, an executive, um, and it didn't work very well uh, until that executive actually went and decided to live in Shanghai. The work was done by the Chinese, sure, but you have to have somebody there to be, if you like, a cultural um, in, interpreter and uh, go between. Otherwise, it's very, very difficult to work in China. So until my executive went to actually live there, things didn't get off the ground. Now, I heard some things that I really liked. I heard about. Uh, retaining human uh, capital, not in the sense of preventing them from going, but creating an a, a attraction to make them stay. And involving the private sphere is all important as well. These young people, young graduates, have to uh, acquire those soft skills, which are very important skills to maintain in-house. And these are skills that uh, can't really be learned very uh, directly or in the classroom. And uh, they're learned when, in fact, you have work experience and then go back to studying when you have long periods abroad and so on. The fundamental point that we can't get round and we have to face is that we have to develop the conditions here so that uh, people will come back or people perhaps can work abroad but with Italian companies that want to become part of that country. 
Going back to what was said before, the question was how can we link up these small and medium-sized enterprises to R&D activities, link them up with the university and put them in contact with the talents that come out of the university. I'm very strongly convinced that Italian SMEs does have an enormous amount of R&D capability. What it doesn't have is a propensity to go out and be open to the wider world. When I hear that Germany, in fact, exports much more food than Italy, 50% more food, and we're behind Belgium in the exports of food, well, I'm really amazed because it's certainly not scant quality of our production of food, but we don't have the right networks, we don't have the right communication, we don't have the right sort of strong networks. For example, when I see in China uh, queues of uh, people lining up at Starbucks to in uh, uh, fact pay 3.5 euros uh, for a poor Starbucks coffee, and you know, and Prodi knows that 3.5 euros will buy you masses of food. When I see that sort of phenomenon, I say, well, we are really falling behind in Italy. We need a different mindset because our food is much better than that. And we certainly need to plan. We have to decide what we want to be from an industrial point of view what our objective is, and this is the key, because and everything else will cascade from that. We have to decide whether we want to be a manufacturing country. We have to decide what sort of technology we want to target. And we shouldn't do this in an academic, formal point of view, but we have to make this decision. We have to outline it, and it has to be uh, then translated, if you like, in incentives and policies. And if we think that we can go backwards and do things as we did them before, we're wrong. I think that, uh, in fact, we have the possibility of working in these complex words today, difficult, high technology word, worlds that in fact have a great deal in common with our and recognize our cultural specifics and also our joie de vivre and our lifestyles. And if we recognize these things and put them in terms of a policy, I think that we can guarantee ourselves a serene future for us and our children.